Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm Catherine Langevin Falcone. I'm the Senior Advisor, Ad uh, Knowledge, Advocacy, and Partnerships in the HIV and AIDS section at UNICEF New York. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to the webinar on results presented at CROI 2019. This is the annual conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections that was held in Seattle in March with abstracts on PMTCT, pediatric, adolescent, maternal, and adult HIV curated and presented by Dr. Lynn Mofensen. Dr. Mofensen is known to many of you, and she's a great friend of UNICEF. She's the HIV Senior Technical Advisor at the Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And prior to that, she was with the National Institutes of Health for 26 years, where she directed the pediatric and maternal HIV program. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mofensen and all the participants joining us on the webinar today. Um, just a few words about the format of the webinar before we start. Dr. Mofensen will present for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. We'll take all of the questions using the chat feature. Um, you can start sending the questions as, as they occur to you during the presentation, even though we won't be taking them until the Q&A portion um, starts um, after Dr. Mofensen's presentation. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat for the whole time of the webinar. Um, my colleague Carthy here will be sending um, a link to the um, PowerPoints as well as a list of the acronyms that are being used in the presentation, which you might wish to refer to at any time during the um, presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Mofensen. Thank you. Hi there, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening. So I'm going to um, give you a presentation on some selected abstracts from CROI. And let's see if I can make this move. So I'm, the first group we're going to talk about is pregnancy and ARV drugs and pregnancy outcome. The first, uh, the first trial I want to talk about is IMPACT 1081. This was a randomized trial of raltegravir with two NRTIs compared to efavirenz with two NRTIs in 408 pregnant antiretroviral naive women from South America, Africa, Thailand, and the US. Uh, initially, they presented to ANC at 28 to 36 weeks to be randomized, but about halfway through, this was expanded to allow enrollment at greater than 20 weeks gestation. The primary endpoint was viral response, which was defined as viral load less than 200 at delivery, and the delivery uh, endpoint is what they discussed. And so you can see from the results that raltegravir was superior to efavirenz in terms of viral load less than 200, 94% versus 84%. And interestingly, if women enrolled early enough, if they enrolled between 20 and 28 weeks, the response rate was similar between the drugs. And it was in these late presenters, those who enrolled uh, greater than 28 weeks, that the difference was really seen with 71% versus 93%. And this slide shows you the Kaplan-Meier curve of the estimated proportion of women achieving virologic suppression. In red is raltegravir, in blue is efavirenz, and you can see that the median time to viral load less than 200 was uh, about 50% or more shorter with raltegravir, eight days versus uh, 15 days with efavirenz. And viral load decline was greater with raltegravir than efavirenz at study weeks two, four, and six. And you can see if you stayed uh, on the drugs long enough that they uh, ended up similarly. And if you look at a variety of different endpoints, viral load decreased by week two and sustained, or two log decreased or less than 200 by week two, you can see that raltegravir was superior to efavirenz. But if you looked at viral load less than 1,000 at all time points after week four, the groups were similar. And staying on the drugs was similar as well. 
Both regimens were well tolerated. There was no difference in adverse events or pregnancy outcome. And one raltegravir and six efavirenz infants were infected, but this was not statistically significant. The next trial is the DOLPHIN-2 trial, and this is an open-label randomized trial of dolutegravir versus efavirenz uh, in women enrolling from Uganda and South Africa, 268 pregnant antiretroviral naive women, again late presenters presenting at 28 to 36 weeks gestation. And here the primary endpoint is virologic response to viral load less than 50 at delivery. And like the other study, this analysis is reporting on delivery data. Uh, it was a, an intent to treat analysis, 122 dolutegravir, 115 efavirenz. The uh, median gestational age at enrollment was 31 weeks, with the median of 55 days on treatment prior to delivery, and there was no difference in baseline characteristics between the groups. And you can see that dolutegravir was in terms of viral load less than 50, 74% versus only 43% with efavirenz, and a borderline statistical significance for viral load less than 1,000, 93 versus 83%. Uh, and this looks at the viral load overall, which we had just discussed, 74 versus 43 percent, and then broken down by viral load strata, CD4 strata, and gestational age at entry. And you can see that dolutegravir was superior to efavirenz in all situations, but I do want to point out that both drugs had significantly lower efficacy at high RNA, although dolutegravir was still superior. And this shows you the Kaplan-Meier curves for viral load to less than 50 and viral load to less than 1,000. And you can see the proportion of women with viral load less than 50 or 1,000 was greater with the dolutegravir arm. And you can see the greater rapidity with the dolutegravir arm. Uh, preterm rates were similar between dolutegravir and efavirenz, and this is very similar to a study from Botswana that looked at women starting these drugs during pregnancy. There were four stillbirths. All were in the dolutegravir arm. None had any congenital anomaly. And there were three infant infections at birth that were thought to be in utero, uh, and these were in the dolutegravir arm. So these infections occurred prior to starting study drug. So moving to talk about uh, antiretroviral regimen and viral suppression in Brazil. So this study looked at about 8,500 pregnant women uh, over 15 years with a median of 29 years. Most of the women were antiretroviral experienced. Uh, there's a echo there. Can people go on mute? OK. Um, so most of the women were on uh, antiretrovirals for greater than two years, 42 percent. 38 percent were antiretroviral naive. And the endpoint that they looked at was viral load less than 50 at two to six months after the first prescription in pregnancy. Overall, 77 percent had viral load less than 50. Uh, and this looks at the different regimens and on multivariate analysis when comparing to efavirenz art in blue, there was a 36 percent higher odds of suppression if on raltegravir in red and a lower odds of suppression if on lopinavir ritonavir, which is in kind of orange. Um, although I have to say that it's not, to me, very impressive. 80 versus 82 percent doesn't seem to be that much, but it was statistically statistically significant. Other factors associated with suppression are not surprising. Lower baseline viral load, higher baseline CD4, older age, higher educational level, and somewhat um, non-intuitively, a shorter time on treatment. And this may be because so many of the women were on treatment for a long time, and you may have some decreased adherence in women who were on ART for a long time. That may be why it says lower time on ART. Uh, this uh, study 
looked at maternal HIV RNA after delivery and correlated this with infants who are infected and their pretreatment HIV RNA. So these are data from 40 mother-infant pairs from the early infant treatment study in Botswana who enrolled at less than seven days from delivery with a median enrollment age of two days. All of the infants received uh, standard prophylaxis for Botswana, um, and when they were diagnosed with HIV, they were changed to treatment. Maternal RNA was done at infant enrollment, so at a median of two days, and infant RNA was done at baseline prior to starting treatment. And this box shows you the different types of exposures. 42% had no antiretroviral exposure, 25% efavirenz, 28% uh, dolutegravir, and 5% lopinavir. And remember, these are all mothers who had infected babies. And so a higher maternal RNA correlated with a higher pretreatment infant RNA. And if we look specifically at dolutegravir, you can see the lowest infant RNA values were in those exposed to dolutegravir uh, RNA at, at uh, time of diagnosis of only 310. And this could potentially affect the ability to diagnose uh, infection in those infants of mothers who are uh, of infants of mothers who are on dolutegravir and are infected. Uh, I'm going to move to talk about dolutegravir in specific. Uh, so the first study I'm going to talk about is the antiretroviral pregnancy registry, which had a poster looking at integrase inhibitors and neural tube defects, over 20,000 pregnancies and over 10,000 first trimester exposures through July 2018. Um, a comment that the APR reports come primarily from countries in which there is folate food fortification, which affects the background rate of neural tube defects. The primary analysis of the pregnancy registry is the prospective data, women who are reported while they're pregnant and then followed up for outcome, and the prevalence of birth defects is compared to the Metropolitan Atlanta Congenital Defects Program and the Texas Birth Defects Registry Program, which are the population-based rates, as well as first versus second and third trimester. There's also retrospective cases. These are cases that are reported after birth, so they have no denominator, not included in the prospective uh, evaluation, but are included in a secondary review for clusters and patterns, as well as clinical studies, which are reported to the registry. These are also included in secondary analyses. So looking specifically at integrase inhibitors and neural tube defects, there were 1,193 live birth with integrase inhibitor exposure. 604 of these were periconception, including 174 dolutegravir, 186 elvitegravir, 244 raltegravir. There were no neural tube defects reported in the prospective cases. Two central nervous system defects, one was a neural migration disorder with preconception dolutegravir, um, and one was with second or third trimester dolutegravir. In the retrospective registry, there were seven neural tube defects plus two encephalocele cases. Um, remember, these are cases that are reported after delivery um, when a defect has occurred. There's no denominator, and they're not included in the prospective data review. Um, five of these occurred with dolutegravir. Four of them are the Botswana cases, which are here, and there was one case pro uh, retrospectively from the U.S., uh, and four were with raltegravir, two of which had preconception exposure. Um, there were several other uh, presentations on neural tube defects. I'm just giving you one that was from uh, Glasgow in October 2018, which was a Gilead review of their databases on pregnancy with 155 preconception elvitegravir, 18 preconception victegravir exposures with no neural tube defects. Um, and a retrospective reports, they had 318 reports with two neural tube defects. Um, and you wouldn't expect this because it's retrospective. So again, these are reports with defects. Um, Merck reviewed their database on pregnancies with raltegravir exposure. 
they reported 456 periconception raltegravir exposures with no neural tube defects, and 435 retrospective reports with the neural tube defects that we had already talked about in the pregnancy registry, since this includes the pregnancy registry. There was also a report from the French perinatal cohort on prospective cases. The cases of raltegravir are included in the Merck review up above, but they also had 41 cases with dolutegravir exposure, 42 with elvitegravir exposure, um, no neural tube defects reported. So this is reassuring data, but the numbers are way too small to be able to draw any definitive conclusions. Um, then there were a series of uh, abstracts that looked at fetal and infant growth, compared dolutegravir versus efavirenz exposure. Um, the first did ultrasound fetal biometry in 435 pregnant women. Uh, 167 were uninfected, 268 were HIV infected with 176 on dolutegravir. Um, so when they compared HIV positive versus HIV negative mothers, they found no significant differences. And when they compared HIV positive mothers receiving dolutegravir or receiving efavirenz, they also saw no uh, significant differences between dolutegravir and efavirenz for fetal growth. They also looked in Botswana at uh, birth anthropometry in uh, infants similarly HIV exposed and HIV unexposed and HIV positive women on dolutegravir versus efavirenz and found no difference in weight for age Z score or length for age Z score either between positives and negatives or dolutegravir and efavirenz. Uh, this was an interesting presentation. This was a Ugandan clinic experience following the neural tube signal. So following the clinical safety alert about neural tube defects in dolutegravir, the clinic developed a response plan and all, all women who were less than 55 who were receiving dolutegravir and were contacted and brought in for a group counseling session. Women of childbearing potential were referred and had pregnancy testing. For those who were not pregnant, they were asked about their pregnancy intentions and offered family planning. And women who intended to conceive were offered a Favrin's treatment. And the remainder of the women could stay on dolutegravir even if they didn't uh, decide to receive family planning. So 9% of the women, uh, 692, were on dolutegravir. The majority of them were reviewed by September, which was when this was uh, looked at. 510 women were of reproductive potential, and 5%, or 23 women, were pregnant. All had initial ultrasounds without deformities. So when they looked at the remainder of women of childbearing potential, who were not pregnant. Um, there were 108 women who planned to conceive, and these were either switched to efavirenz or another regimen. And of the remaining uh, majority of women, 79% opted to stay on dolutegravir. Oops. And the majority of these women actually did not choose to receive effective contraception. So they were kept on dolutegravir regardless of their contraception choice. And the clinic noted that they needed to do some more work in terms of helping women use effective contraception. Uh, this was a study that looked at modeling the impact of dolutegravir introduction on NNRTI resistance in South Africa. So the top uh, curve is giving dolutegravir only to naive individuals. The bottom curve, number two, looks at giving dolutegravir to both naive and experienced uh, individuals. And the black line shows you what happens if you just keep everyone on efavirenz. And you can see the increase in uh, resistance to up to about 30%. So they found that giving dolutegravir to all patients, regardless of gender and regardless of treatment status, that's the yellow line here, resulted in the lowest rate of NNRTI resistance by 2035, 8.2%. That if you limited dolutegravir only to men in pink 
or to men and women of non-childbearing age, women of non-childbearing age, you result in uh, an increase in resistance to about 17 percent. And that including men and women using contraception stabilized resistance at around 11.8 percent. So this is very similar to uh, some other risk-benefit analyses showing that the uh, benefits of switching everyone to dolutegravir, including women of childbearing potential, results in the greatest benefit. Uh, then I'm going to move on and talk about HIV-exposed but uninfected children. Uh, this is results from a uh, factorial designed trial called SHINE. It was a community-based randomized clinical trial that compared the effect of improved infant feeding, improved hygiene, or both versus standard of care on growth in neurodevelopment. Uh, so women were randomized in clusters of uh, catchment areas and were confirmed to be pregnant, and they were randomized to either the control, which involved village health workers encouraging early antenatal care, exclusive breastfeeding. In green, the infant and young child feeding, where the village health workers also gave an interactive module for improved complementary feeding, as well as a nutritional supplement between 6 and 18 months. The WASH. Uh, in blue, which was uh, an improved pit latrine with hand washing stations, soap, chlorine, play station, and uh, hygiene counseling, and then combined infant uh, and hygiene uh, um, interventions. So if we first look at HIV-exposed uninfected versus HIV-unexposed children, we had 738 and uh, about 4,000 respectively. The first poster looked at mortality and growth, and if we look at the HIV-exposed uninfected children, you can see that they had significantly more problems than the HIV-unexposed children, uh, including a 39 percent higher 18-month mortality and significantly more uh, growth abnormalities, particularly stunting almost 50 percent. Uh, the next poster looked at development, look, using a Malawi developmental assessment tool and a communicative development inventory, uh, and found that HIV-exposed uninfected children had lower total development, gross motor, fine motor, and language, as well as uh, problems with a vocabulary checklist compared to HIV-unexposed children. If we then say, in these HIV-exposed uninfected children, are their outcomes improved by the intervention? Uh, this abstract poster uh, looked at growth and compared the children at 18 months in terms of growth and found, the color here is wrong, infant and young child feeding, which is here. Um, but not the WASH intervention, not the hygiene intervention, significantly decreased the rate of stunting. So HIV-exposed uninfected children had decreased stunting, 40% uh, versus 50% uh, with the infant and child feeding, and a decreased prevalence of anemia. Uh, this uh, next abstract was an oral presentation, and it looked at the developmental outcomes, the same uh, that was looked at in the prior slide. Um, and this is an early child development sub-study, uh, and this is at age two years, and found a significant improvement with the combined infant feeding and sanitation intervention, but interestingly enough, not significant when uh, given by themselves. And this improvement in their score scores brought them basically to the same scores as the HIV unexposed children. Uh, moving on to talk about maternal health issues, this study looked at incident infection in pregnancy in Botswana. Um, so they uh, abstract HIV status from all women delivering at the birth surveillance study hospitals, and they looked at women who were uh, not known to be infected at the start of pregnancy for whether they seroconverted, and they found 39 seroconversions in over 15,000 pregnant women who had had two or more tests for an incidence of 6.5 per thousand person years. 
um, the median gestational age at time of seroconversion was 29 weeks, which did give them time to start women on treatment prior to delivery. And among those women without a third trimester test, based on the uh, incidence rate, they estimated that 10 seroconversions may have been missed due to lack of testing. So then they looked at um, as mother-to-child transmission rates among women with known HIV infection decrease because they're on effective treatment, the proportion of transmission due to seroconversion during pregnancy is going to increasingly become important. So for example, if we take the transmission rate among HIV-infected women on treatment as 0.5%, and we say that the risk of transmission if you seroconvert is 20%, then almost 30% of all mother-to-child transmission in Botswana will be due to seroconversion. So this is an extremely important area to target. This study looked at South Africa and the prevalence of sexually transmitted infections in HIV positive and uninfected women uh, was a Am I okay in terms of uh, speaking? Okay. Um, this was a cross-sectional study of 242 pregnant women in Cape Town, tested for STIs at first ANC visit. And in blue, you see HIV-infected women, and in uh, orange, you see HIV-uninfected women. And you can see that the overall STI prevalence was significantly higher among the infected women than the uninfected women. And you can see the different infections that they looked at. Um, the factors associated with sexually transmitted disease when they did a multivariate analysis was being unmarried, uh, being HIV infected, and having recent STI symptoms. So this shows the importance of doing uh, sexually transmitted disease uh, evaluation for all pregnant women, but particularly for infected pregnant women. This study looked at the issue of women on efavirenz and rifampin and whether this might cause problems with contraceptive DMPA injections. So they were estimating what the optimal dosing frequency would be for DMPA, which is currently every 12 weeks, based on keeping a target serum level of 0.1 nanogram per ml. And they had 42 women who were not pregnant that had uh, HIV and TB, were stable on efavirenz treatment and on continuation phase of TB treatment, and they gave an injection of DMPA and monitored pharmacokinetics. So they found for all women that the target level was achieved through week 8, but starting at week 10, they began to see women who had levels below target. And at week 12, which is ordinarily when you would give the next dose, 12% of women had levels that were low. Um, the progesterone levels stayed low, suggesting no ovulation, but they suggested that in women receiving efavirenz and rifampin together, that you might consider shortening the DMPA interval from 12 to 8 to 10 weeks during co-administration period. Uh, there were a number of uh, studies on male partner testing that were interesting. Uh, this first one is from Kenya, and they looked at providing self-tests to 758 uninfected women seeking routine ANC, uh, and they offered them self-tests to bring home to their partner for self-testing. The women were instructed on use and received the oral fluid tests, and they assessed data on outcome at one month uh, follow-up. Uh, so they had 758 women with uh, unknown partner status. Um, of those, they found that 63% or 508 accepted HIV self-testing, and you can see the reasons for declining over here. Of those that they had data on, 390, 76% did offer the self-test to their partner. And again, you can see the reasons for declining here. And of those partners who were offered the self-test, the vast majority, 93%, used it. So 63% of women of partners with unknown status accepted the kits. 
76% offered it to their partner and 93% of the partners had tested. So that looks very good. But they didn't really look at what happened after that. And that was done in uh, this study, which is in South Africa. And they looked at um, 1,100 pregnant women with a partner who was HIV negative or unknown. And they were offered three different options for partner testing, either testing at the facility the partner comes in, uh, testing at home by a trained counselor, or offering self-testing. And incentives for post-test counseling were offered to the, for the self-testing, including free airtime vouchers for texting the counselor. Um, the women were primarily single, and 37% uh, were primate. 21% of the women were HIV positive. So out of the women who were HIV negative uh, and had partners of unknown status, if we first look at facility testing, 223 uh, men were tested, 9% 20 were HIV positive, and 18 of the 20 were linked to care. Home testing was not very po uh, popular. At 28 men were tested, two were HIV positive, and one of the two were linked to care. Uh, and among HIV self-testing, here we had 668 men tested. But even with the incentives, only 60% of the men who were tested actually called back to receive post-test counseling. Um, 23 self-reported they were HIV positive, but only 14 of 23 came in for a confirmatory test. All of those who came in for a confirmatory test were linked to treatment. So if you looked at the cost per confirmed HIV diagnosis, the cost was actually highest with HIV self-testing. So HIV self-testing was the most popular, but also the most expensive per HIV infection diagnosed. And they concluded you needed operational research to improve linkage to confirmatory testing and care. And finally, there was a randomized trial of index self-testing in Malawi at three district hospitals. So they compared a standard of care in 135 people, which is passive partner referral with a referral slip that they take home to their partner to come into the nearest health facility. Uh, and uh, 349 who were randomized to receive the OraQuick test, where the partner was given the OraQuick test to bring home. So they found similar partner distribution um, of the, the little slip and the test, that more partners were tested with the self-testing, 73% versus 27%. HIV prevalence was similar in both groups, which is what you would expect. Um, but that treatment initiation in the HIV positive partner was actually lower among self-testing, only 22% compared to 75%, although the numbers here are very small. So partner return for HIV for antiretroviral therapy was relatively poor. And there were some problems reported with use of the self-test. 65% of the partners needed help, and 7% couldn't interpret it. So HIV self-testing tested more people, identified uh, more HIV-positive partners, but needed better instruction and linkage to care, and our treatment was poor. So again, very similar that we need to, if you're going to do alpha HIV self-testing, you need to pay attention to the end parts of that cascade. Moving on to talk about antiretroviral drugs in children. There were a series of presentations dealing with dolutegravir in children. This first poster dealt with children who were on, mostly on treatment, uh, and switching them to dolutegravir. The pre-dolutegravir suppression rate was 59%, and after switch to dolutegravir, it was 80%. And this was similar uh, regardless of age, and they had very low adverse events. So dolutegravir looks pretty good in switching in, in kids greater than five. 
Uh, the next presentation came from IMPACT, and Ted Rule presented data from 1093. Prior studies had uh, shown that the dosage that they had selected for six months to six years was too low. So this was now looking at a higher dosing of the dispersible tablet uh, based on weight, ba weight band 15, 20, and 25 uh, milligram doses. And they found that this increased weight band dosing was uh, successful for the children. So they have now defined dosing for six months to six years. Uh, the next uh, study uh, came from Odyssey, which is a clinical trial, and they did a pharmacokinetic evaluation of using the adult dose of 50 milligrams of dolutegravir uh, and a 30 milligram dolutegravir dispersible tablet in kids for whom a lower dose is currently recommended, and found that the this is the 30 milligram, and here is the uh, 50 milligram. They found that these profiles were similar uh, between the groups, that the peak levels were slightly higher than adults, but felt that this could support the use of an adult dose for children over 20 kilograms. And the last dietegravir study looked at modeling to estimate the dose for neonates so that they based this on pharmacokinetic studies of raltegravir, and they simulated different dosing strategies as shown here, either giving a standard total dose or giving a uh, initial run-in followed by a second level dose. And they found that the dosing of two milligrams or five milligrams were too high or too low, but that dosing between three and four milligrams, both just starting with that or as well as giving the run-in, gave dosing that was was potentially appropriate. So they believe they've defined at least the doses that should be studied within neonates. Uh, this is from the early infant treatment study. This is a study that's uh, evaluating children early in life at birth and identifying infected infants and starting immediate treatment. Um, and the, they presented data on 10 infants with complete testing out at 84 to 96 weeks, and they compared their early infant treatment in green here with children who started at 1 to 12 months and suppressed adults. Uh, and if they looked at first at cell-associated proviral levels, you can see with the early infant treatment, uh, there were significantly uh, less cell-associated provirus compared to the control group of kids starting at 1 to 12 months and the control group of adults. And they also looked at the defective proviral DNA and found that at 84 to 96 weeks, the early treatment group here um, had um, an increase in defective proviral DNA, a decrease in intact DNA, and both were lower than in the control group and the treatment group. So early treatment looks good for the reservoir. Uh, this study then looked at whether there was a difference if you started infants at less than seven days of age compared to seven to 28 days of age. So both would be viewed as having early treatment. Uh, and they found that while the overall probability of suppression at 48 weeks here, this is the early treatment in red, whoops, sorry, uh, and the later treatment uh, at under a month in blue. Um, so at the later out, uh, uh, periods it was the same, but that the probability of early suppression by three to six months decreased by 35 percent for each week that elapses prior to starting treatment, and you can see that in the Kaplan-Meier early um, less than seven days in red and the green is treated after one week. So the earlier the better, basically. I'm now turning to adolescence and PrEP. Um, so the first study came from Malawi, and it was looking at recent HIV infection. Uh, enrolled pregnant women who were newly diagnosed, and then they used a recent infection testing algorithm to define recent infection. 
Um, so the estimated 11.7% of those who had a new diagnosis were felt to have recent infection based on the algorithm for an annualized incidence of 0.59%. And the incidence was higher among those 20 to 24 years compared to 15 to 24 years and if they resided in Blantyre. And the prevalence of recent infection was higher in those who were never married, those who were primeps, those who didn't know their partner's age, which meant they were probably older, um, uh, if their partner was known to be HIV positive. Not surprising. Uh, then there was a lecture that was done that reviewed all the PrEP demonstration projects in adolescence, found similar findings across all of the projects that PrEP interest and uptake was high, uh, more than 90% in the HPTN082 study, that the risk, the risk score of PrEP acceptors was high, so that these were women who were at high risk, STI prevalence 30%, a high percent of uh, last year intimate partner violence experience, and a high percent of depressive symptoms, limited contraceptive use. And concluded that PrEP should be offered as part of a comprehensive youth-friendly services, delivered as part of a package of sexual and reproductive health services, and respond to the greatest health needs, including screening for intimate partner violence and referral for mental health services when serving these adolescents. Uh, this study looked at uh, a study that was offering PrEP to adolescent and young women in Kenya in three different settings, routine ANC, uh, postnatal care, and family planning. Median age was 24. Over half had a partner with unknown HIV status. Unfortunately, they found continuation rates were relatively low. 38% at one month, 21% at three months, 10% at six months, and it was similar regardless of delivery point. Uh, continuation of PrEP use at three months was independently higher among women who knew that their partner was HIV positive, so that's good, and older women who were 35 or above, and that at six months only partner HIV status correlated with continuation. And the most common reasons for stopping PrEP included a low perceived risk of HIV, having side effects, pill burden, and that they knew that their partner was negative, so didn't feel they were at risk. Somewhat different results were from, reported from South Africa. They looked at adherence now using a tenofovir diphosphate assay in dried blood spots at three months with high adherence defined as uh, greater than 700 and median adherence three. Uh, and in the three Ps for prevention study, they enrolled 200 women, 16 to 25. Retention was 89% at three months, 50% had high, 80% had medium adherence at two and three months, and high adherence was associated with either the partner was unknown or HIV positive, and that the young girl was, women to, was willing to disclose her PrEP use. Uh, and in the HPTN 052 study, they enrolled uh, 551 sexually active women, 16 to 25, median age of 21, and they found similar results, very high um, adherence defined by the dried blood spot levels, 84% with 25% high, 48% medium adherence. Um, and predictors of high adherence included attending an adherence support group, not being depressed, and a higher number of sexual partners. Uh, this study looked at, this is really in adults, but it compared TAF and TDF in women and was a pooled analysis of seven clinical trials. And they basically found the viral response was the same in TAF, which is in purple, as it was with tenofovir in, uh, in orange, as you can see up here, but that bone toxicity and renal toxicity were significantly improved with TAF. So you can see bone mineral density goes down with tenofovir, is stabilized with TAF. Uh, same thing with GFR. And the reason I 
um, included this was because there was a study. This was conducted in MSN and transgender women, but it looked at um, FTAF compared to FTDF for PrEP. And basically found that the FTAF had uh, seven infections, the FTDF had 15 infections, and that they basically uh, were non-inferior. And that when you looked and compared this to no PrEP, that you can see that both regimens were significantly effective. Uh, and they also found, similar to in the women, that bone safety and renal safety was better with TAF. So we may be seeing a move to FTAF instead of FTDF for PrEP. Uh, moving on to talk about TB in pregnancy. Uh, this was a prospective cohort of women with and without TB disease in South Africa. And what they did was evaluate outcomes by whether the women reported that they were taking IPT or not IPT if they had no TB disease, and they looked at pregnancy outcomes. Um, and they found that IPT use in the second and third trimester was not associated with a higher rate of adverse outcomes in these women. Um, and it actually was higher adverse outcomes in women who were not using IPT in blue compared to women who were using IPT in orange. And this actually contrasts with data that were presented last year from a much larger clinical trial, randomized clinical trial, of uh, giving IPT during pregnancy versus deferring it to 12 weeks postpartum. And in that study, they actually found the opposite result, which was that um, adverse events uh, pregnancy outcomes were higher in the immediate IPT compared to the uh, deferred IPT. Uh, so I ended up relatively confused as to which was actually better, um, but basically felt that perhaps it is that most things were not statistically significant. Uh, this looked at improving child TB contact management, not, yes. Uh, it's a cluster randomized trial, and it's focused on the first two steps of the TB uh, prevention cascade, contact exposure identification and screening. Uh, and here you can see what the standard of care does, uh, and they added to this a series of community-based interventions to improve uh, contact management. So they had 973 adult cases in the register, 490 to the community-based intervention, uh, 483 to the standard of care. When they looked at identification, there was really not a significant difference between the two, 44% uh, versus 34%. And when they looked at their primary outcome, which was the yield of contacts per child per adult case, there was not a statistically significant difference. So we're not doing so well with identifying uh, child contacts of TB cases. Uh, this study looked at nevirapine PK and TB therapy. And even though we're not really going to be recommending nevirapine treatment anymore, I thought it was of relevance for people to see. Um, so this looked at nevirapine in kids with and without TB. Uh, and they found that the proportion uh, with uh, low nevirapine levels was 61% when it was given with rifampin versus 31% when given in kids without TB or the kids who were off rifampin. And in multivariate analysis, TB co-infection in, uh, influenced nevirapine PK. And you can see here, if you compare the kids who were on treatment and then when they went off rifampin treatment, you can see that um, trough levels, peak levels, and AUC increase when they're off rifampin, and clearance uh, decreases off rifampin. So that's a little bit concerning. Um, and now we're going to move to test and treat and viral load testing. This is the last group. Uh, so this first is the HPTN 071, and it looked at the impact of universal testing and treatment in Zambia and South Africa 
randomized communities to either standard of care, including treatment according to national guidelines. RMB was the POP, our intervention, uh, and our treatment according to national guidelines. And you can see what the uh, the pop art combination intervention was, which included community testing, uh, STD and TB screening, and the full pop art, which included immediate treatment. And they then uh, looked at the sample at uh, time 0, 12, 24, and 36 months. Just to point out that national guidelines change during this study. Uh, to be universal treatment. And so if you look and compare the full pop art intervention with the partial part art, art intervention, you basically have very similar uh, treatment uh, endpoints here. Uh, they found that viral suppression by arm uh, did increase with the pop art intervention, but not significantly. Their primary endpoint was incidence, and they did find a significant difference in uh, incidence, a 30% reduction in the pop art with national guidelines, and a 7% reduction with the pop art with universal guidelines, which seems a little bit confusing, but I wonder if really these are both the same thing and you can uh, put them together. So they concluded that they could achieve the 90-90 targets. It reduced incidents in that community-based service for universal testing and linkage are key components of prevention. Uh, there was a randomized clinical trial in Botswana that was somewhat similar. You can see here their intervention in 15 communities included community mobilization and home and mobile testing versus standard of care. Uh, and they, they assessed their intervention with an end-of-study survey uh, in one pair of communities per region. They found a significant increase in testing across the cascade with the intervention. So in blue, you see standard of care at baseline and study end, and it goes down, and the intervention at baseline and study end, and it goes up. So testing coverage went up. HIV diagnosis went up significantly. Art coverage also significantly increased. Viral suppression also significantly increased. And male circumcision also significantly increased. So uh, pretty good. Uh, this study looked at factors associated with persistent viremia. So it's using the Rakai Community Cohort Study. And they measured viral load at 2011, 2015, 2016. Most patients were suppressed, 80%, either durable or new suppression. 16% had persistent viremia. So they looked at what factors were associated with persistent viremia and found being younger, less than 30, being male, never married, and recent in-migration were all significantly associated with persistent viremia. Uh, and I think this is the last study. This looked at point-of-care viral load testing. So this was a randomized trial where the intervention was viral load testing and same-day counseling by a nurse for stable patients um, and versus standard of care, which is lab-based viral load testing. The primary outcome was 12-month viral suppression and retention. And you can see there was a significant difference, 90% viral suppression and retention versus 76%, statistically significant. And if you look at secondary outcomes, viral suppression less than 50 and retention, all significantly increased. If you looked at um, having viral load done and having rapid communication of results, uh, the intervention in increased this. Follow-up to care, including switching to second-line therapy and referral to uh, stable treatment programs, were significantly increased with point of care. And healthcare utilization was uh, better and required fewer visits with um, point of care. So this was very encouraging, the point of care viral load testing giving the patients their results and counseling them was effective in improving a variety of different endpoints. And I think 
that brings us to the end. Um, I don't know uh, whether you want me to go through the key takeaways or we should just take questions at this point. You know, thank you so much, um, Dr. Morfinson. The, the presentation was excellent, uh, very complete, very insightful. Um, you have very kindly offered to stay a little bit beyond 10 o'clock, so I just wanted to flag for um, participants who also would like to stay for a little while beyond 10. But let's see how many questions start coming in. Uh, let's open it up um, for questions. There's one um, which has come in during your presentation, um, and I'll read it, but I encourage anybody who also has um, questions to um, start sending them through on the chat. And um, perhaps um, right before we close, we could quickly run through the takeaways. Sure. If that's okay. Uh -huh. So the question, the question that has come from Pinto, based on various comparison studies of EFV and DT, DTG, the use in pregnancy, it shows almost similar outcomes, though we see faster viral suppression with DTG. So does it make logical sense to subject women to sign consent forms? which acts more to bar them from using DTG. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it makes sense to require women to sign consent forms. First of all, if you're starting diotergavir during pregnancy, you don't have the concern about neural tube defects, and if you're particularly if you're talking about late presenters. Uh, and secondly, I think even for those in whom uh, you're starting and they may be preconception, I think counseling your patient and noting that you've counseled them is adequate as opposed to requiring signing a consent form. So I agree with you. Great. Let's let's take any other questions that come through. Well, everyone can certainly take take the slides. Um, I think there's a, also a larger slide set that will be available through UNICEF. Absolutely, and um, you know, I was just, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps, uh, first of all, the there's so much information and so much good information, and perhaps it's it takes um, some time to process. Um, I, I was going to offer for anyone who, to whom it occurs, to ask a question, but after the hour, um, to to contact Carthy or myself by email, and we'll make sure that Dr. Mofenson gets the, gets the um, question and we'll get back to you. Another one has just come in from Teresa. Um, thank you, she says, for the great presentation. Any information on folic acid uptake on those with abnormal birth defects? Yes, yeah, so if we look at the Botswana data, uh, Botswana does not have food folate fortification. Um, so the, the baseline prevalence of neural tube defects is going to be higher in that population, making it easier to be able to determine if there's a problem. So of the four patients who um, had neural tube defects in the Botswana study, I believe two of them received folate, but after they were pregnant already. So, of course, the neural tube closes by day 28 before men even know that they're pregnant. Um, and most of the countries in whom we have data from on neural tube defects, for example, the data that I presented here, they all come from countries where there's already food folate supplementation. So women are supplemented with folic acid when they eat. Um, and so the background rate of neural tube defects in those populations is going to be significantly lower, meaning that you would need much larger numbers to be able to detect a problem if it was there. I hope that um, helped to answer your question. Just uh, maybe another comment, that, that if you're looking to be able to rule out um, an increase in birth defects, if you have a birth defect with a prevalence of 3%, you only need 200 exposures to be able to rule out a twofold increase. But if you have a prevalence of neural tube defects of 0.1%, you need at least 2,000 exposures to rule out a threefold increase in defects. So the prevalence of the defect in the population really defines how many exposures you need to be able to determine a problem. 
Uh, I see there's another question. Has there been community engagement pertaining to linkage to care for self-testing? Um, not that was presented at the meeting. Um, and they didn't specifically present the obstacles uh, for this. Uh, I think all of the posters that discussed this basically said more operational research is needed. There's a big emphasis on HIV self-testing, but not as much of an emphasis on what happens after the self-testing occurs. Yeah. So I think we need operational research to, uh, to look at that. I see yeah, another question. Like Would it make point. sense to, should I keep going? Yes, why don't yeah. you keep going, Lynn? Thank you. Okay. Would it make sense to recommend raltegravir in women seroconverting in pregnancy instead of efavirenz? Yes, absolutely. You have a much more rapid viral decline. Raltegravir or dalutegravir will result in a, a much more rapid viral load uh, decrease. So yes, I totally agree with that. Uh, how is viral load self-testing done after secondary distribution assessed? How is it assessed? Um, it was assessed through self-report um, in one study and through interviews of the partner. They interviewed about 60% of the partners, I think. So that's how it was done in those two studies. Um, what's the relative cost of point of care viral load testing versus lab testing now? Hmm. I think I think that they evaluated that, but I don't have it on the slide. I think they found that the, that the cost was relatively comparable. Um, uh, I, I thought that the data on point of care viral load testing were was uh, was pretty convincing and uh, is something I, I, I myself believe that if you are able to talk to their patient about their results at the time you're seeing them, you will have more of an effect on their adherence to treatment than if you have to have them come back in a month to find out their results. Looks like that's a uh, question so far. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, maybe it makes sense right now to run through the, the key takeaways. And if any other questions come up during the um, takeaways, then we'll take them at the end. But um, we're winding down. So um, back back to you with the with the takeaways, Dr. Mulfinson. Okay. I thought the main results were, so the studies during pregnancy showed that the use of an integrase inhibitor was particularly important in late presenters to be able to achieve rapid viral load decrease. And I think the, the person who asked about seroconverters is right on. The data on dolutegravir and other integrase inhibitors on birth defects was reassuring. But as we just discussed, there were really insufficient numbers of preconception exposures to draw definitive conclusions regarding neural tube defects uh, yet. And I hope that by July, we'll have more definitive data from Botswana on a larger number of patients. Um, infants in infected despite maternal treatment, particularly women on dolutegravir, may have a low infant viral load, which may complicate initial diagnosis of infection, and people should be aware of that. And that incident is increasingly important as a cause of new infant infections. In terms of maternal health, there, there are high rates of STI in HIV-positive women. Uh, and that concomitant use of efavirenz and rifampin may decrease uh, contraceptive levels requiring a shorter uh, injectable contraceptive intervention during dual use. Um, we saw worse outcomes of HIV-exposed uninfected children versus unexposed children in terms of mortality and growth and development, but we also saw that better nutrition and sanitation could significantly improve those HIV-exposed uninfected infants to look more like the unexposed infants. In terms of pediatric treatment, Dolutegravir dosing for younger children now appears to be evaluated, and it's possible that the adult dose may be able to be used uh, in children uh, greater than 20 kilograms, and that very early treatment decreases the viral reservoir in children, and the earlier the better. 
Uh, in adolescence, incident infection in young girls remains a problem, and PrEP is very acceptable by young girls, but adherence and retention seems to vary between the studies. South Africa showed good adherence, Kenya did not. Um, TAF appears as effective for PrEP as uh, tenofovir, at least in MSM in transgender women, uh, not yet studies in heterosexual transmission, uh, and this has potential advantages for women. Um, uh, for TB, IPT after the first trimester in pregnancy appears safe in the study that we discussed, but in uh, the randomized clinical trial from last year it appeared associated with a potential increase in adverse pregnancy outcome, so I'm not sure the answer is actually completely there. Um, we still need better ways to optimize uh, child TB contact tracing. And rifampin given with nevirapine may decrease nevirapine levels. And then the last series was HIV self-testing improves male partner testing, but linkage for confirmatory testing and treatment remains suboptimal and needs research. The universal test and treat approach appears to work to improve identification treatment suppression and to decrease HIV incidence, so that's very exciting to see. And then finally, point of care viral load testing, improved suppression and improved retention. And I don't think I see any new questions. No new questions. So I think that we will just now uh, conclude the webinar. Um, in parting, let me say that if there are any other questions that occur, um, please send them in an email to Carthy or myself. We'll arrange for for you, uh, Dr. Moffinson, to get those, and, and we'll get back to the, the person who posted the questions. We will post the PowerPoint and a recording of the webinar on the childrenandaids.org website. Uh, that will be done very shortly. I'd like to thank Dr. Moffinson for joining us with an excellent presentation and the curation of abstracts from CROI, and for your good attention to the questions asked by all of the participants. We'll really look forward to being in the same space this summer with a presentation following the 10th uh, IAS conference on HIV science that will take place in Mexico City in July. I'd like to thank all of you who took the time to join us on the webinar today. I hope it's been interesting and useful uh, to you and your work. So thank you to everybody and wishing you all the best. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.